Amen. Let me just uh, give you some powerful questions today. In fact, these are the three questions that David had to wrestle with when he was in adversity. And they're the same questions that you and I have to wrestle with when we go through a season of adversity. And I want you to notice that I didn't say if you go through a season of adversity. I said when you go through a season of adversity. And the first question is this. Number one, will you accept help from the friends that God gives you? Will you accept help from the friends that God gives you? The longer I study God's word, the more convinced I am that God doesn't want anyone to have to face adversity in their life alone. One of the first things that I see that God did for David uh, was that he gave David a friend. Now, I want you to picture this today, okay? David had just killed Goliath, all right? Goliath's fallen to the ground. He's lifted up Goliath's head like this, and, and now he's talking to King Saul, okay? And what I believe was that David's time of being faithful in natural things had come to an end, and now he was entering another season in his life, a season where he was going to face great adversity, okay? And, 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 and here's the first thing that God did. This is in the change of season. He was going from one season, the season of being faithful in natural things, to the season of adversity. And the first thing God does is give him a friend. This is what it says, 1 Samuel 18, 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as himself. You see, the scripture goes on to tell us that, 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 that uh, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he, he cared deeply about him. And what they did in those days is they would give something of themselves to the other person. So Jonathan took off of his robe and, his, and he gave him his sword and different things and, and gave that to David. And what happened was that the hearts of David and Jonathan became knit together. The relationships, uh, the, the relationships that relationship may have actually preserved David's very life. And I won't go into all the details of it, but without Jonathan's friendship, David may have perished. Uh, David may have returned to Saul and, 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 got, and been killed. Without Jonathan's counsel, David may have made critical mistakes in his life. How many of you are grateful for a friend? How many of you ever had a friend like Jonathan? Now, in the New Testament, we have guys like Paul the Apostle. And man, I, I respect Paul the Apostle. He was a great guy. In fact, in one of his books, he says, Everybody deserted me. I mean, the, everybody just left me except for the Lord himself. And I, I was able to stand all by myself. And don't get me wrong. If you find yourself in a place where you need to stand all by yourself, I believe that God's going to help you. God's going to give you the ability to stand all by yourself. But the truth of the matter is that most most of us, when we're going through times of adversity, we need somebody else alongside of us. Come on. We need a, if we're a David, we need a Jonathan. Come on. If we're a Paul, we need a Timothy. We need somebody beside us to encourage us down life's road and down life's way. I even think of Peter, you know, he didn't stand up all by himself. The scripture said he stood up with the 11, all right? Let me tell you what the saddest calls that I get in the church office are, okay? They're from people who randomly call churches uh, looking for someone just to pray for them, looking for someone to hear their hurt. And we're open to receive those kind of calls, obviously, amen? But instinctively, people know, I'm not supposed to be alone in this. I, I need somebody else. I, I, need, I, I need someone to help me. I need someone to, to pray for me. And if you're going through a season of adversity, my friend, let me just say you need your family. You need the body of Christ. And you need others. Come on. And so the question that we have to consider is, am I willing to accept help at my point of need? But you know there are people who kind of brick themselves in. Did you know that? They lay one brick of pride at a time and they put up a defensive wall and they kind of say, you know what, I'm just not going to let you know what I'm going through. I I'm not going to tell anybody about it. And what happens to them is they get weary in the battle and it's easy to be unfaithful when you live your life in isolation. Now I've told this story before and it's a true story, but it bears repeating, all right? 
about 19 years ago when we moved into this building. That was a long time ago, right? Some of y'all were just young, wet behind the ears. Okay. But anyway, all that time ago, there was a mother and her daughter that began attending here on, a, on, on, on Sunday mornings. And they came for, I don't know, four or five months. And then we had a church dinner. They stayed for the dinner. And during that dinner, people naturally began to want to get to know them a little bit better. So someone invited them over for coffee. I think someone invited them to their house for dinner. Someone invited them to, to a Sunday school class. Uh, you know, and different things like that were happening during this church dinner. And then on Monday, I received a very very angry telephone call and an email and this lady and her daughter they simply said to me pastor Bob your church is way too pushy you're trying to push yourself on us you're trying to make friends when uh, yes I, I want to just come to church there I don't want to go for coffee with anybody I don't want to know it I just want to come to church but you're too pushy why did you coordinate all that they thought I had coordinated all that I would like to have told them, you know, I, I am such a great administrator that I actually did that. But I'm going to tell you, I had nothing to do with it, okay? And they informed me, we'll never be back. That's what they said. Months passed. In fact, I think about a year passed. All of a sudden, I get an email. It was the daughter, and this is what she said. She said, my mother has fallen and broken her hip. We're here without any family we're here without any people. We're here all by ourselves. Would you pray for us? I tried to respond to the email. I tried to call the numbers that I had, but there was absolutely no response. It was like a brick wall. I wonder, did they ever begin to realize that God was trying to bring family into their life? God was trying to bring people into their life who would stand with them, who would love them, who would care for them, who would be there for them. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for the family of God. I'm grateful for the friends that I have. I'm grateful for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand of praise for inventing the church of Jesus Christ. Proverbs 17 and 17 says this. It says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversities. Why did God give you brothers? Why did God give you friends? They were born because he knew you were going to have adversity in your life. Years ago, I was facing a huge hurt in my life. I was crying. The telephone rang. I was literally crying physical tears. And it was a good friend of mine, another friend in the ministry. And he just simply said three, about four words. He said, Bob, I heard what happened. And then these are the words that touched me. He said, I am your friend. That's all it took. Come on. How many of you know sometimes we just need a friend? And let me tell you, there have been many times in our life when people have come alongside of us and are there to sustain us. And you've got to make up your mind that you say, I'm willing to accept the help that I need from my friends amen number two this is the second question you've got to ask yourself if you're in a season of adversity number two will you live according to the principles that you believe in now, will you live according to those principles that you believe in adversity will test you to see if the truths that you espouse you actually follow and David believed this principle one of the principles that he believed was that he was not going to touch the Lord's anointed. Right? God had anointed Saul as king. God had rejected Saul as king. David knew and understand all of this. But David believed this, that if anyone was going to deal with Saul, it wasn't going to be him. It should be God Almighty. Two different times David could have very easily taken Saul's life. Now remember this, it was Saul who was trying to kill him. It was Saul that was causing him to run and having to flee. It was Saul who was unrighteous. It was Saul who was consorting with the, with the witch of Endor. It was Saul who was using deceit and trickery in his dealings with David. It was Saul who was jealous, even though all David was was a faithful servant and a faithful warrior. Saul had tried to kill him. It was Saul who had caused all of this adversity in his life. But David had this principle, I'm not going to touch the anointing of the Lord 
In one of the conversations he had with Saul after sparing Saul's life, he said in, in 1 Samuel uh, 26, 33, he said, The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. Think about that. How many of you believe that the Lord rewards those who are faithful? For their righteousness and faithfulness. Amen. That was David's principle. And he said this, The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. David knew God would reward those who were faithful to the principles that they lived by. Let me tell you, adversity will test the principles uh, that you live by to see if you really believe them. Now, many years ago, just before I came to pastor this church, we were missionaries and I felt our time as a missionary was coming to an end all right we had missionaries in South America and Colombia and uh, I had it all figured out has anybody ever told the Lord how it's all going to work out how'd, the, how'd that go for you come on well I had this all figured out in my life and I had told the Lord okay Lord I got resumes out and as soon as I get a church well then that's when I'll resign and I'll I'll go from being paid you know as a missionary to being paid as a pastor does anybody around here like to get paid come on wave your hands if you like to get paid I'm the same way hello but you see God had other plans and so I wound up having to to resign before I got uh, this church And, and, and and I remember going to the mailbox and supernaturally God gave me four hundred dollars in the mail has anybody ever went to the mailbox when you had a need and there's a check in the mail come on well that was that I'm telling you an absolutely true story and so I had $400. That's all the money that I had in my bank account at the time, all right? $400. And so I, and I, I was stressed out. I was in a season of adversity as far as I was concerned. And I remember going to church at Trinity uh, Church in Cedar Hill. And Pastor Hennessy was getting ready to take up the tithes and offerings. And I've been a tither for my whole life. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, I got $400. I've got no future of income that I can see. And the Holy Spirit said, to me he said listen uh, Mr. Bob did you work for that $400 I said no sir he said are you going to tithe on that $400 I said yes sir I'd like to tell you that I was a cheerful giver but I'd be a liar if I said that come on I gave that $40 believe in the Lord and trusting in God amen it was the hardest $40 I've ever given in my life it was like okay there's the $40 Okay, God, I did it. Did you know that very next week I got calls from three different churches, wound up coming here like about eight or nine days later, amen, and wound up getting the check from here, amen. God provided my needs. I, I, I'm just telling you that when you're in a season of adversity, the Holy Spirit's going to test you to see if you actually do the things that you say that you believe in. Come on. Let me tell you another story. This is a story of an old fellow by the name of Ira Stanfill. He a songwriter. Some of you who've got a little gray in your hair like me might remember some of his songs, all right? Let me give you some of them. I've got a mansion over the hilltop. Supper time. We'll talk it over in the by and by. When I was a teenager, okay, I, I heard Ira Stanfield preach and he was an older man, okay? I'm sure he's been with Jesus a long time now. But let me tell you his story, okay? Earlier in his life, he was an evangelist, and he married a, a lady who was a piano player, okay? And she was a lovely singer and a piano player. And they were going around the country holding meetings and having, you know, serving the Lord together. Uh, but but, but uh, because they were in radio stations live, the people would ask this piano, do you play a little jazz? Do you do a little other types of music? And her heart, this his, his wife's heart fell away from the Lord. In fact, she completely fell away from the Lord. She completely backslid. She began to sing in bars. She became an alcoholic. She lived a very promiscuous life. She would even sometimes come to the very place where he was preaching and call out and try to heckle him as, as, as he would preach. But you see, in those days, they had a, a strong teaching and belief that you'd never should get divorced and and well he you know so 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 he he refused to divorce his wife finally she divorced him and and uh, years later he was working as an associate pastor all right 